Hello, uh, my name is Maria Varitilina. Uh, my name was just mentioned by Adam. I'm uh, thankful to be able to moderate the discussion afterwards, after the keynote of Madina Tlostanova. Before I start the introduction of Madina Tlostanova, I would like to mention that I'm the only Ukrainian participa uh, participant in the symposium for now. And I would like to mention that Ukraine has lost ten thousands of lives of persons who are daily fighting on the front line. And I would like to ask you for a moment of silence for all of the victims of war of Russia against Ukraine. Thank you. Um, so we will start with the keynote of Marina Tlostanova that will last for about 40 minutes and then we'll have a discussion which I will start with a question and then afterwards you will be invited to um, ask questions yourself. Uh, Marina Tlostanova is a feminist thinker, fiction writer and professor of post-colonial feminisms at the Linköping University in uh, Sweden. Her research interests include the colonial thought, feminisms of the global south, post-socialist human condition, fiction and art, critical future inquiries, and critical interventions into complexity, crisis, and change. Madina Tlostanova wrote, co-authored, and authored numerous works and books, including What Does It Mean to be Post-Soviet? The Colonial Art from the Ruins of the Soviet Empire, and The Coloniality of Knowledge, Being, and Sensing. Marina Tlostanova, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Maria, for this generous introduction. Thanks. Um, you know, coming to Prague is in itself wonderful, uh, but also meeting this wonderful collective and meeting all, also uh, uh, different people who were invited for the symposium. But at the same time, I was thinking, what can I talk about? It's always a problem with keynotes. And this year, <laughs> this year there are so many uh, you know, events in different parts of the world that start with decolonizing something. And uh, for me, this is an issue because you know, I've been doing decol decolonial stuff for 23 years by now. <laughs> and so sometimes uh, I have an issue with that because I think that uh, the word is being and the concept is being sometimes uh, instrumentalized, you know, depoliticized, it's very difficult to see who's using it and on, on, who's, on which political spectra these people stand. Uh, but I know that in your case it's not about appropriation or hijacking, it's an honest uh, attempt to understand how, how can we deal with these decolonial issues and decolonizing things in this particular context, which I think uh, is, uh, is very important, it's very complex, it's much more, it's much more complex than uh, in uh, the usual places where people write and reflect on the colonial stuff, like Latin America or Global South in general. Uh, and that's why I came up with this title, asking the other question, inter-imperial, anti-post-colonial, decolonial, post-state socialist, you know, you have all of these strange words here, right? Uh, uh, words that, it, they try to define something, but they fail, actually, because today there are so many countries and groups uh, and populations that don't want to be called state socialist or post-state socialist, uh, they don't like to be called peripheral or semi-peripheral, but we still have to somehow address, right, uh, this specificity. Uh, and uh, we still have to, to kind of define it in some way. Why? Not because we just need definitions, but because we want to understand how our situation is different from many other situations. Like how this post-colonial condition, as an, as an existential condition, as a historical condition, clashes uh, against these socialist and post-socialist legacies that are still here. And I mean, even today, this morning, I just had a couple of hours, I was walking in Prague, and I could see this. 
Uh, I could see the, uh, the ancient legacy, some of which you both mentioned, right, that you can read this if you know a little bit of history, include, including the darker side of modernity, of course. And then you see some socialist stuff that is still there in buildings and the way it's organized. And it's really interesting. And then you see the modern, the, the contemporary things and how people deal with it and what they make out of it, right? So, and that is very hard to explain to somebody who only knows about uh, colonialism, especially Western colonialism. And that's why asking the other question is such an important thing. And of course, it's not my phrase, it's Marie Matsuda, a feminist writer and uh, lawyer who came up with this idea in 1991. Uh, she was trying to explain here, you can see in her quote, that uh, the way I, she tries to understand the interconnection of all forms of subordination is through a method she calls ask the other question. So when you see that something looks racist, it's important to ask the other question and see what else is there. Maybe there is patriarchy there. Or when something looks sexist, she asks, where is the heterosexism in this? And uh, of course, this is a, uh, by now a standard feminist approach, intersectional approach that we all use. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, outside feminist thinking is not so well known. And that's why very often uh, we see today oversimplified, flattened discourses in which people focus on just one uh, kind of uh, kind of um, one kind of um, discrimination uh, or one one history or uh, one uh, way of interpreting things, which can be post-colonial or can be post-socialist or can be something else, you know. And so the point is to avoid this and to. Um, complexify the way we look at things from the start rather than flatten and simplify it. And this is another scholar, Kathy Davis, who also works a lot with this asking the other question uh, and uh, she reflects on how difficult it is to actually implement it and says that it's hard work of making sense of the connections between these categories of difference and interpreting them in terms of power is precisely what has yet to be done. So we can promise that we'll do that, but it's very difficult to actually do this. Uh, on the other hand, and I don't want, want to go too much into detail here, maybe later when I give you some examples from, from art, uh, I think the, that artists are actually uh, most wonderful in, in trying to ask these other questions because you work in different media and you don't just explain it as some kind of boring logocentric article as we academics do, but instead of that you make an artwork uh, which is intersectional by definition and relational and that is what makes art so wonderful as a, as a way of decolonizing. Um, uh, and of course uh, asking the other question is important because uh, it focuses, forces us to focus on these unexpected intersections and uh, opacities between different spheres that uh, maybe otherwise would have remained uh, uh, you know, uh, separate and we would never think of them together, right? Uh, so these entanglements can be very, very different and here are just some random examples. They can be, for example, between uh, economy, politics, uh, uh, geopolitical instability, conflicts, uh, all of these things that we see in the current crisis of the world. Uh, but the problem is that most of them, uh, you know, scholars and scientists, they are trained within very limited and increasingly limited and narrow disciplinary traditions. And uh, so that's why they, they are able to only focus on one optic of looking at things, right? And very seldom they hear each other and uh, connect. And again, I think that art uh, and some kind of uh, bordering kinds of research, for example, artistic research, art as research, or film as research, uh, can sometimes um, actually overcome these limitations of academic thinking uh, that uh, are uh, evident today. Uh, one more thing that I wanted to mention, uh, Noemi, you already said in, in your opening speech that uh, there are certain concepts and categories that we can implement uh, when we look, for example, at Central Europe slash Eastern Europe 
uh, or when we look uh, at the former Russian colonies and Soviet colonies, but that would be a, a bit different story, of, of course, uh, again. Uh, and I would like to add an, uh, another category to this. This comes from Laura Doyle, a wonderful scholar. Uh, and uh, it's a concept of interimperiality, which I really like. She just published a book several years ago about that. And then uh, my colleague and the colonial, the colonial co colleague and friend, Manuela Boatka and Anka Parulescu, also used it in their book uh, about Armenia recently. So this interimperiality is important because it explains precisely the situation uh, in places like. Uh, 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 like Central Europe, uh, where you find several empires coexisting, sometimes simultaneously, sometimes one after another. And all of these layers, uh, historical and cultural layers, and dependencies, and duress, and legacies, they are still there. Uh, and then uh, the problem is, uh, or the problem starts, as she says here, when uh, when we have uh, nation states, when the national discourses uh, start to be uh, constructed somehow, right? And then you have to be very selective because you have to have a very kind of coherent national history uh, and that's why some of its elements have to go. You have to, for example, select that you were connected with Austrian-Hungarian Empire, or, but not with the Ottoman Empire, right? Because it's not European, it's, it's not a good idea to kind of remember that legacy. So it's just one example as it can happen. And she, she I think, is very right when she says that this interimperiality is what we need to keep in mind when we deal with Eastern Europe or Central Europe or the Balkans. Uh, but it's the same, for example, if we speak of Central Asia. It cannot be just Russian Empire. It should be other uh, uh, you know, influences as well. Uh, all my um, native Caucasus is another story, uh, right? Because you have several inter-imperial influences there and this multiplicity of inter-imperial inter histories. Uh, and one of the issues here, of course, that keeps us apart, unfortunately, uh, is, of course, this fixation, fixity on national identity and nation, nation states and this kind of mentality that uh, keeps us apart, right? Uh, and that's why Doyle offers us to kind of broaden it a little bit. Uh, and I, I, I find it uh, really productive. Uh, and uh, as uh, it says here, yes, we can talk about, for example, the Ottoman, Austrian, Hungarian, and Tsarist, also Russian Tsarist empire imperialities that compete and contribute to uh, shaping of the richly mixed uh, national imaginaries that emerge uh, later, right? Uh, as sim simultaneously or one after another. Uh, and I'm sure that many of you who know about histories of this uh, late imperial uh, you know, like cultural uh, context, you have examples from that, right? So many people who were born, for example, in the, in, in the Habsburg Empire, they couldn't come to terms later when this empire collapses and they become citizens of smaller uh, nation states, right? Because uh, it's, it's a par paradox, right? You become independent, you become free, you can develop your national identity, but at the same time something lacks as well. And it's not, of course, to, to, to say that it's good to have empires, but we have to remember these sensibilities if we want to think of what is happening today and how it can be made sense of, of course. Uh, yeah, now, this can the conundrum, the anti-post-colonial. This is a question that I hate, because for 20-something for years, whenever I come to some event, people say, so can you tell me what is the difference between post-colonial and decolonial? This is like a key question. And I mean, I wrote five articles about that, and we wrote a book with Walter Mignola 15 years ago about that as well, but people still ask. And I think that now it's particularly toxic, this question, because uh, on the one hand, uh, we see that uh, people are confusing and distorting these terms. And because they are very much politicized now, they are not academic questions. These are issues that are, as I said, hijacked by very problematic political parties sometimes, and people, you know, and these discourses are very selectively hijacked. That's another issue. Like if you listen to some of Putin's speeches, you will see that he's also hijacking some elements of anti-colonial discourse. And of course, very in a very specific way. It's always criticizing the Western colonialism and imperialism, but never seeing 
uh, the Russian colonialism, right? So, but that is, again, it's not nothing new about that. It's not that he invented it, because the Russian Empire was always like that, already in the 19th century, you can see these discourses, right? Uh, but what, what is important, I think, is to always be historical here and to always be in the, within a certain context and not take concepts out of, of this historical, you know, kind of environments. Why? For instance, recently we had a conference in which colleagues were telling me, we don't need this post-colonial or decolonial designer, it's just jugg you know, juggling new terms, who needs this? There is anti-colonial. But they forget that anti-colonial discourse was formulated the way we know it today in a very specific time during the Cold War. It was very much connected with the political decolonization processes that were going on then, and also with this rivalry between Soviet Union and the US or the West or the collective West, if you wish, wish right? Uh, and that's why uh, the, the central thing there was, of course, this political decolonization, political decolonization, and not epistemic or aesthetic or any other. So it was a question of how to become free and how to become independent. But uh, the colonial discourse is a different thing, uh, and that's why it's not the same. You cannot just say, okay, post-colonial or decolonial. Why? Because the colonial thinking originated from Latin America mainly, right, or from people who were Latin American but ended up in, in, the, in the West, in the U.S. mostly. It comes in a very low moment in the early 90s when uh, Soviet Union collapses, uh, you know, the, the socialist world collapses, uh, and so the global left is very pessimistic, feeling very pessimistic because their kind of utopia in which they believed uh, is, is gone. So from then on, it's only neoliberalism, and it's only the consumer society, there is no future. Future is gone as an ideal, it's just a constant present of these consuming consumers and consumer societies. And so uh, it was very tragic, tragically taken by the global uh, left uh, everywhere, uh, including no the North and the South. Uh, and uh, most of the future decolonial theorists, they were the leftists. They were, many of them were Marxists, actually, right? Uh, and only then they discovered the, the indigenous thinking for themselves. And so they uh, realized at some point in the early 90s that the state, the nation state, cannot be decolonized and cannot be democratized. Meaning that uh, although uh, anti-colonial movements happened already in the 50s and the 60s, we still have neocolonialism. And it didn't work out, actually. Right? And they also realized, OK, the socialism as, a, as an ideal is also gone. Uh, so now, uh, what do we do? And that's why uh, uh, there is a lot of critique uh, of the colonial thinkers today that why don't you deal with economy? Why don't you deal with open political fights and struggles? And why don't you prepare people for revolutions? No, because the, this, the movement itself was created at the point when they, they realized it's not possible anytime soon to change it. So let's work with people's minds. Let's decolonize the way we think. And in that sense, of course, they go deeper than any post-colonial uh, theorists, because post-colonial theorists still were describing uh, let's say, the other uh, from the global south to the global north, using the global north uh, concepts and terms and the language, like Lacan, for instance, or Derrida, and things like that, right? Uh, so in that sense, the colonial thinking t wanted to go further. Uh, I'm not saying that it actually did it, but uh, it promised to go further and questioned the very uh, kind of grounds of modernity, the very grounds of looking at the world and dealing with the world and with other people according to modernity, not as a historical reality, but as, as a set of uh, frameworks, let's say, as an optic, as a way of dealing with the world and relating to the world. Uh, and um, uh, so that, I think, is an important difference. And I'm not trying to defend uh, the colonial option and say that it's better than post-colonial. It's not, because all of them have their pro and contra. Uh, and actually now, since uh, the full-scale Russian aggression of Ukraine started, I am uh, more and more having issues with my decolonial colleagues because they don't understand the situation. They, they, they fail to interpret it 
within this framework. Uh, and I think it's important to, to, to actually write about that. And Sam actually finishing writing a new work on that, in which I explain what went wrong with the colonial thinking. But I'm telling you all this because I think that it's very dangerous to, to kind of, you know, just accept it and say, okay, let's now decolonize museums, let's now decolonize. It's not going to work like that because decolonization is a process, it's open. It's not, uh, it's open ended in the sense that we can never reach a result and say, okay, now we decolonize everything. We have a wonderful world, decolonial everything. No, it's always not enough. Uh, but it also has to be self critical. And that is, I think, something that unfortunately some of the colonial thinkers lost. Uh, and the, the same, of course, uh, that I already mentioned that we need to think uh, about how we relate to, to, to the region. Um, generally, I mean, I'm against any area studies uh, frameworking and division of the world into regions, but we have still to deal somehow with it, right? And so, uh, what terms to use? Do we say post-state socialist? Do we say former second world when it's like more than 30 years after, right? Do we call it semi-periphery as many of my colleagues in colonial thinking do? Uh, or this globalist that was offered recently by someone, right, that I think it's very ridiculous, or do we still say East Europe, uh, and how do we define these intersections of imperial, colonial, and ideological duress uh, and their aftermath? Uh, I think that there is no one answer to that, uh, but of course it depends, again, on our geopolitics and corporate politics of knowledge, of sensing, of being... Uh, that's what we tried to explain with, with, with Mignola long ago in uh, our book about uh, decolonial thinking and decolonial knowledge production. Uh, and uh, mm, uh, in this sense, I think that uh, actually some of the artworks and also some of the research produced in East Europe uh, and Central Europe uh, is very rich, is very promising, and actually it, it's something from, from which decolonial thinkers could learn something. But the problem is that there is still a lacking dialogue and there is still a, a hierarchy or hidden or open, right, of who reads whom, who quotes whom, and how it actually all works, as you know better than me, right? Uh, yeah, uh, this is also related to what I've been talking about, these limitations of the main narratives and tropes explaining recent history and contemporaneity and their inability to hear each other. This inability to hear each other is is key here, right? So there is the anti-colonial narrative, the global one that we all know, right? And uh, uh, there is even now a very toxic um, kind of bitter word that I heard recently people say, there is a self-splaining of everything, meaning that uh, people from the global south are uh, feeling entitled to this discourse because this is what is, is kind of everybody knows about anti-colonial discourse and post-colonial. And so uh, whenever we disagree with something, uh, uh, we hear this, this reaction like, you know, you are... Uh, I, I hear this a lot, you know, for example, in Sweden, some of my uh, radical leftist anti-colonial colleagues say, yeah, but you're not criticizing the U.S. enough. So when you're criticizing Russia, uh, it almost seems like you are pro-U.S. <laughs> so, you know, it doesn't work that way. I'm against both, actually, you know. But it's very hard to explain because this black and white thinking, this kind of, you know, binarity, unfortunately, wins because it's easier to deal with it, right, and to slide into that. So this anti-colonial narrative, we all know how it works. And there, of course, unfortunately, when it gets to this populist level, the main uh, enemy is the, the collective West, right? And that's why it's so easy for uh, all these uh, strange people, some of them you mentioned, to actually <laughs> use it in, in their you know, campaigns, right? political campaigns, again, to take something out of this, of this critique in a very tendentious way. But the anti-Soviet narrative, I mean, of course, you can question the way, should, should we call it that way, but I call it that way because this is also something that you have in Eastern Europe, uh, for a good reason, of course, because this is one of the freshest memories, being colonized or invaded by the Soviet Union and, you know, uh, imposed uh, with certain things. And, 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 of course, that is something that people still remember, uh, and they're still alive, you know, who went for that. Uh, and the anti-Soviet narrative in that sense, 
to some extent clashes against the anti-colonial uh, because it, it paints a different picture. It shows the darker side of the Soviet modernity, its colonial side, its genocidal side, and all of that that the global left doesn't want to hear about, of course, right? Even now. Uh, and, uh, uh, but the interesting thing is that it's, it's a very false contradiction because in reality, both of them come from the same source of modernity. It's just that each of them wants to see only one part of the story and they refuse to hear each other. And I think that this is one of the important things that has to happen now, that people need to relearn how to hear the other story and how to also think relationally and connect it in a very complex way because it's a very complex connection. Uh, to to their own uh, thinking. Uh, and I've, I mean, I've been thinking about it for a long time. I can tell you uh, one of the examples coming from our feminist thinking. We had a conference in 2015 that I co-organized uh, in Linköping University where I work. And uh, we wanted to invite feminists from both Eastern Europe, uh, from post-socialist countries, so to say, and also from former Soviet countries and people from the global south uh, and see if there is a dialogue between them, if they can hear each other, if, if they can see these different aspects of coloniality uh, in socialist modernity and post-socialist and also in, and in this one that is uh, connected with, with Western colonialism. And it, it was very asymmetrical, you know, like people from uh, Eastern Europe came uh, and they were ready to discuss those colonial theories and concepts and see and, and you know, critique and see if they work or they don't work for their countries. It was already there, but I could not get anybody, we could not get anybody from the global south who would be interested in critiquing socialism and its darker colonial side. And then I saw the same when I went to India to give several lectures there. I was also talking with different people. And it was really amazing uh, how, how that, um, uh, you know, it's not brainwashing. I mean, I don't want to offend these people, but it's something that they still want to believe in. You know, they don't want to come to terms with the idea that socialism can be colonialist. So, so that, I think, we need to talk about that because we know how it was, right? But unfortunately, our voices are almost never heard. But that's another thing, right? Like, uh, it's very interesting because then, seven years after that, when we wanted to do a book, a collection based on that article, and I wanted to talk with some of the top Western uh, experts on that, uh, who, of course, uh, never lived in Soviet Union or in uh, Czechoslovakia, right? Who never knew what happened there, but they were experts, you know? And they were telling me, you don't understand anything. There was never racism. It was a proletarian internationalism. What do you know about this? And I said, well, I kind of do because I'm a black in the Russian society. I'm not Russian. I'm always told everywhere, you're a black, you should shut up. You cannot be a professor. So I do know about it. But, uh, uh, of course, this is what kind of uh, unfortunately keeps uh, happening all the time, right? Yes, uh, this is imagery I mentioned. Um, yeah, and I do think that this post-socialist story and post-socialist narrative and history allows to complexify and problematize the coloniality and decoloniality narrative and also place it within a specific historical, political, social, and cultural context of the Cold War, and then decolonization, the collapse of the socialist system, the upsurge of the global neoliberal capitalism with its initial narrative of the end of history, of course, uh, and then turning of the former second world into a void. That's a metaphor that I also like. I think it was first used by uh, Croatian feminists uh, uh, long ago. Uh, this void, that we don't exist. Uh, it, it's like n our voices, they exist, but nobody hears them. And it's very interesting that how they fall through, you know, because we cannot join either the global north or the global south. That's a, also an interesting thing. Uh, there is a, a very a good uh, American political scientist, uh, also decolonial, Jennifer Sutherland, and she describes this, um, you know, intellectual division of labor in feminism. But I think it works also for art and also for other areas. She says that 
during the socialist time, there was a division like that. Like people from the global north, then first world, right? Uh, they were responsible for theories. They made theories, they theorized, because they were people from the first world, right? And then there were feminists from the third world who were only allowed to speak about racial difference, cultural difference, things like that, and describe their own personal experience of how they were discriminated. That, that's what their role was in that, right? They are people who writes very well about that. And then there were second world feminists who actually had a voice during the Cold War, and that they were responsible for certain t themes. They were allowed to speak uh, about uh, uh, the, the peace in the whole world, yeah, so the peace narrative, uh, and of course the ideological differences. Then what happens when all of this goes, God knows where, right? Uh, this is not necessary, and whenever they are trying to become part of the global north, they're not allowed. You cannot theorize if you're from the second world, right? And if you if they go and want to talk about race and racism, say, no, it's not your narrative. What do you know about race, right? It's people from the global south who should speak about that. So that is a very interesting situation. That is also, it needs to be further kind of, you know, reflected upon, criticized, and dealt with. But in order to do that, we need to hear each other. We need to not sit within our own standpointism and standpoint critique and this kind of victimhood rivalry or who suffered more. Uh, it's important to discuss all the sufferings, of course, but we also need to overcome it somehow at some point. And uh, I don't know how, I don't have recipes for that, but to come up with some idea of not maybe solidarity, but some kind of coalitions because if we continue and keep on making more and more smaller groups, uh, each with their trauma, let's say, right? It's very hard to kind of deal with the complexity of the crisis that we have today in the world. Uh, and again, I don't have recipes, but I think there is no recipe and will be no recipe unless and uh, until we start actually speaking and, and listening to each other. But unfortunately, it's not happening uh, anytime soon, right? Uh, yes, and this is something that I also wanted to mention. This is what I'm writing about, and I don't know how my decolonial colleagues will see this, because it is rather critical of what they've been doing in the last 10 years. Uh, uh, because I think that what attracted me originally in decolonial thinking in uh, 1999, I think, when I first learned about it, still then living in this horrible Moscow, I um, uh, read a book and I found that uh, Mignola or maybe Dussel was talking there about double critique. And I think that double critique is very, very important for decolonial thinking and for decolonizing anything. But unfortunately, this is something that they lost and they forgot about it. Uh, the, the double critique uh, doesn't allow you to simplify the discourse and see only one enemy and kind of, you know, use this enemy as a straw man or straw woman or, I don't know, straw something uh, in all of your discourses. Uh, and um, uh, this, this concept actually comes from Abdel Kibir Kitibi, uh, who is a writer, uh, Kitibi, and uh, um, also a, um, a thinker, a sociologist, I think. Uh, and uh, he, he's a Moroccan writer, and subsequently this concept was used by the colonial thinkers and by feminists, by Fatima Mernissi and, and then by Walter Mignolo. Uh, and in his understanding, and Abdel Kabir Katim's understanding, um, double critique is about targeting both Eurocentric and Orientalist discourses and ethnocentric local ones. So in that sense, you see that there is a problem with uh, Eurocentrism and with uh, Orientalism and, uh, and with mm, kind of Western modernity or Euro modernity. But when you look inside this, um, in this case, Moroccan society, but then he, uh, he talks about other Muslim societies as well, he says that people should be also self-critical of what happens there, right? Uh, and in effect, this approach denies binaries and ma uh, Manichaean standpoints, attempting to maintain multiplicity, complexity, and impurity, this impure entanglements that are always there. Because, as you said very rightly, there, there are never these clean positions. This is a colonizer, this is a colonizer. It's never like that. And especially not in our histories that are so messy and so entangled, right? 
Uh, and uh, this is what attracted me. And actually, in 2006, we even did with Mignola a special issue of South Atlantic Quarterly, one of the journals, as a post journal of Duke University. And so we did this issue, of specific special issue on double critique, speaking about Russia, precisely about the Russian slash Soviet Empire and this, uh, these complexes that you mentioned, this uh, infamous quotation from Dostoevsky, yes, this is something that I read many years ago, and I was like, oh, okay, that is a diagnosis of what is happening there, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, this double critique in the case of the Russian Empire, the USSR, and their aftermath entails a critique of at least two, but actually many more, different forms of imperiality, the originally Western, and now global Euro modernity, and then this uh, second rate Russian imperiality, which is always a copy of a copy, right? Uh, with all its specific contradictions and insecurities, and on top, the critique of the local neo colonial, in some cases, if we speak, for example, of Central Asia, and essentialist nationalist forms, in some cases in Eastern Europe, right? Of identification and worlding. So, if this is how this double critique. Could work, and, and that allows to go back to complexity that should be in decolonial thinking. Uh, and there is a Polish example. I recently read this really interesting article by these three Polish authors. I don't want to mispronounce their names because I'm not good at Polish. I'm sorry, but the article is really amazing because they analyze uh, the, the also contemporary Polish art uh, and in connection with memory work. And they talk about dual decolonial option, meaning exactly this double critique. Uh, they don't use the concept of double critique, but they talk about this. Uh, and in, in their case, of course, it's, it's connected with uh, foreign dependencies, by which they mean all of this uh, uh, kind of, uh, not, all, not only colonial, but maybe quasi-colonial, uh, uh, you know, duress, which is, can be Russian or Poly, uh, I mean German or something, right? But, uh, but then they also speak about uh, what is happening today uh, uh, and how this can be uh, instrumentalized in, in constructing national discourses and sometimes nationalist discourses. So I, I thought it was interesting that they came up to this without knowing about Katibi's story and genealogy, but they just formulated the same thing. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, since we don't have that much time, I probably wanted also to mention one example that I think fits very well uh, into what we're talking about today. Uh, yeah. Uh, of course, we all know that uh, nowadays there is a boom in museum work and art worlds uh, um, that is connected with... Uh, uh, with post-colonial and now decolonial art. And anything that people find, they, they want to interpret in those terms, right? And of course, uh, what happens very often is that um, this market, uh, I mean, in a good sense and in a bad sense, that discovers new others for itself. Like, for example, Central Asian art is one of those newly discovered others. That, oh, it's so exotic, so interesting, we don't know anything about it. So there is a wave of exhibitions all over Europe and all European museums and also overseas, all invi inviting uh, art artists from, from Central Asia, which is great, at least they are made, made known. But then there is also a problem in the way they're interpreted very often because I think the good old Orientalism is back uh, and that also makes them do their works and, you know, in, in specific ways because there are certain patterns and certain tropes that they are looking for and these people who are kind of, you know, uh, uh, taking this art to the museums. And, and again, this is not a new story, but it's a new wave of this critique that if you remember in the 90s, there was this discussion of multicultural art in the US, for example. And uh, it was already all formulated, like, what is this multiculturalism? It's a tame form of diversity, right? So you have to be diverse and different, but in a very predictable way, because if you don't, then you're dangerous and nobody wants you, right? Uh, and, and, and that, I think, is a very, very much a problem for many artists today. Uh, and I know different examples. I work with artists so much these days, in the last maybe 10 years. And some of them, they kind of, they adjust to the situation and they use the Salman Rushdie uh, tongue-in-cheek technique. Like, okay, I will 
I will do something that you want me to do, but I actually um, I will be very ironic about this, right? And so I don't think, I don't believe in this stuff that you want me to frame it with, but, uh, but I still do. And others are very honest and they, they just refuse. They are saying, like, uh, for example, the artists with whom I work a lot for many years, Asan Gaisum, a Chechenian artist, and uh, at some point he said that I changed my name and I disowned on all my works that are in Russian museums. And I think this is a, a very good step, like, okay, I cannot take them out of hermitage, unfortunately, but I don't want them to say that it belongs to me. Uh, and, uh, and even before these horrible events, uh, he, he used to call me and then say, like, maybe 10 years ago, like, I don't know, I don't want my work to be in the Russian museums because these are work about the, the, the Russian aggression in, in, in Chechnya, you know, and they destroyed my country, and now they want to put my work in the museum. So how you come to terms with that, right? Uh, and I think that, of course, it's a personal ethical choice, right? You have to, to make it somehow. Uh, at the same time, uh, I don't see that these uh, issues are sufficiently addressed in these wonderful European uh, and uh, American exhibitions where this art is being kind of commissioned, you know, and they're shown. Uh, and then uh, especially it's clear in, you know, all this paraphernalia that goes together with uh, museum texts, like catalog texts, uh, curatorial materials, like who writes that, as you said, like, do people who curate these things even know anything about these cultures? Like, and, and, and who decides this? And for me, these are all big question marks that need to be addressed. Not to say that only Uzbek curators should curate Uzbek art. No. But uh, at least they have to somehow engage critically with what they do and with their own positionality. Uh, and uh, one example that actually is not, I don't want to talk about maybe uh, Davra, because we have Davra here present, so I don't dare, although I think this is a wonderful example, really wonderful, of how you can decolonize museum, how you can take this outside of the museum space, how you can question all the, the grounds of, uh, of modern slash colonial museums, like forms of representation and means of representation. Uh, the way that a documenta expects you, for instance, to produce some kind of art that then can be shown in, in, the, in, the, in the white hall, right? So what, what if you don't do that? And instead of that, we deal with knowledge. We just you know, change, uh, exchange stories instead, and we don't manufacture art objects. So all of these things. But uh, I don't want to steal the, uh, the, the show, so <laughs> we will hear that tomorrow. And instead of that, I wanted to, so, to, to say a few words, and then I shut up about colonial complicity. This is a concept that uh, I think was first formulated by Gayatri Spivak, but in her usual kind of way, you know, uh, fluffy. So then later, some of my colleagues, interestingly enough, in the Nordic countries, in Scandinavia, came back to this, because they think that colonial complicity describes very well uh, what you have in many European countries. When so they say, oh, we never had any colonies. Yeah, but the, you were co colonially complicit because you were part of this global colonial project, like you said, for example, through slave trade or with some other goods, uh, global goods that were traded, like sugar or cane, for instance, or you know, coffee and other things, depending on what country you see. And so that was the story of uh, Sweden and Denmark and countries like that, that always said, oh, we, we did, almost never had colonies. Almost, they had, of course, right? Uh, but their <laughs> participation in global colonialism uh, was e exactly that, it was complicit. But interestingly enough, recently even uh, the countries um, uh, the, uh, of the Baltic littoral, like Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, they also started taking part in this discussion. And I think that the example of Kristina Norman, uh, who is uh, uh, from, from Estonia, and her project Orchidelirium from 2022, uh, was actually uh, uh, commissioned for uh, Estonian Pavilion uh, in Venice Biennale, and I think it's a wonderful, wonderful project. Actually, I didn't like the way it was presented in Venice Biennale, but the project itself is broader than that. It consists of three films, uh, and I think it shows so well this co com complexity, the way that, you, yeah, you're, you're not a colonizer, but you still partake in the global project. For example, in this case, she talks about two Estonians of middle class uh, family, like uh, 
They, they were invited in the end of the 19th century to kind of serve for the Dutch Empire and uh, act as white colonizers in somebody else's colonial project. Uh, I think in Indonesia it was, yes. So they go there, and all of a sudden, their role and who they are totally changes. Because in Estonia, they were second-rate citizens, because, you know, at, in, and at that point, it was a German, uh, a Baltic Germans who were the main uh, kind of strata of the society, the, the, and the, the riches, and they, they were considered more civilized, and, more, uh, and not the Estonians themselves. And so all of a sudden, uh, when they uh, end up in this colony, the, their status changes completely, right? Uh, and uh, this is one s a strain of the story that shows this um, a very conflicting attitude to the story. Like, uh, should we, we be proud of this or should we not, right? Uh, because that con uh, allowed us to be part of the first-rate empires of modernity, right? Uh, capitalist empires. Uh, and another sub-story, which I really love, because I work with new materialism more and more now, of course you can't not, not do it, being in Sweden, uh, and <laughs> so part of it is that it's about orchids, orchids, and orchid delirium, because there was a, 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 this fashion for orchids, for growing orchids, uh, in the 19th century, right? Uh, and it was, uh, of course, um, uh, connected with... Uh, 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 fashion coming from Great Britain uh, and from Victorian kind of uh, cultural context. Uh, and uh, at the same time, it, it kind of brings us back to what is happening today globally also and, and economically in this economy of or orchid growing because, you know, orchids are very popular, right? As everybody wants to buy it. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the soil that they need is actually extracted uh, from Estonian bogs. So, and that way it kind of comes back to Estonia, but today Estonia is acting as a kind of country from which uh, this extractivism happens. So, I mean, it's very complex. I cannot tell you the whole thing, but I really loved the way these nuances were touched upon there. Like, you don't have to be a colonizer, but your role can be very kind of side role, right, and very hesitant, and what comes with it psychologically, because they also discovered the diaries, of course, and whatever these people were writing about. So it's, I think it, it's, it's really amazing. Uh, and there are similar projects, may, maybe less known, also in other East European countries. And I think in, in Lithuania also, I, I read an interesting interview about that. Uh, so maybe this is uh, actually way to go. I don't think we can play it. I can try, but maybe not. But you can find it in the uh, in internet. Uh, it's where Christina talks about uh, her project and explains. And all of these films are available also. You, see, you can watch them. And I think that uh, this is yet another category, this complicity that uh, we should also use. Uh, and then Davra, I already mentioned. Um, yeah, in uh, other projects uh, that leave the boundaries of museum and spill into the world. Uh, which, uh, or with all its conflicting memories, is simultaneously overcoming the temporal limitations of a conventional exhibition in order to interlock with this difficult and non-homogeneous uh, temporality. It can be human temporality, but not necessarily. It can be also more than human or other than human temporality, which I think also many artists work with today. Uh, and such decolonial art overthrows uh, Jean-Luc Godard's opposition of documentary and epic art uh, leaning towards documentary epics instead, I would say. It's not either documentary or epic. It's both, right? Uh, and uh, uh, there are amazing examples of that. I cannot uh, really go into this, but these are just examples that immediately come to mind. Haif Kahraman, an artist uh, of Iraqi origin and... Uh, a refugee to Sweden, now living in the United States, with whom I work a lot. I wrote many texts for her artist books. Uh, and uh, in her case, it's very raw, because she escapes from a war, from this destruction, right? And even today, 25 to 30 years later, she still lives uh, with that memory in her body of these attacks, of these bombings. And of course, uh, Jana Kadirova, uh, as uh, you might know, a wonderful Ukrainian artist, also, her, her project uh, that you see here, uh, Palyanitsa, is, uh, is a very good example of how art can uh, 
uh, a spill into the real world because she actually sells these uh, uh, pieces of, uh, it's not bread, of course, it's made of stones, right? Uh, she sells them and then uh, uh, do donates the money to the Ukrainian army, which I think is a wonderful decolonial gesture, and uh, uh, I really love that. And that uh, Asan Goysum is, as I mentioned already, is a Chechenian artist who also was born in a refugee camp and grew up in a refugee camp. And so these are his raw memories of, of being there uh, and his works uh, that uh, show that you cannot actually go back to the culture that was completely destroyed. And that is the story of, 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 of Chechenian culture. Yeah, uh, so I want to maybe finish this because I took too much time and I want to leave it open like that and hear to what you have to say. almost impossible to cover everything and especially if we talk about art and culture there are so many amazing art pieces that could be a great example also of decolonial art pieces that um, that could be also mentioned in the keynote and um, yeah you covered so many different aspects and um, what I was what I was asking myself about because you were talking also about the distortion of terms of decolonial, anti-colonial, and post-colonial. And we know that actually these terms are largely used now, especially the term decolonial, I would say. And I was myself part of the working group that was called Decolonize Eastern Europe that was based in Hamburg. And um, we were working in the academic context mostly. And then there were, there were many questions coming to that, okay, how can you use this term? And of course there was a lot of critique coming from the academia with relation to that. And you know, currently many activists and artists use this term as well, like decolonial, decolonize something, decolonize art, decolonize knowledge, decolonize parts of the world or certain countries. And I wanted to ask you how you feel about that when it's used in academia, and then when it's, when it's used in art and activism and whether there is difference in these approaches. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a, it's a very important issue. Uh, well, I think I already said that I, I am kind of allergic to it. <laughs> I stopped using the term myself in the last several years, I think. This is too much for me. But you are right. The question here is uh, that actually the academics borrowed it from social movements to begin with, right? But then they appropriated it, they theorized it or whatever, and uh, then this gap between social movements, the colonial social movements, and uh, academics, it only grew and grew and grew, it continues growing, and that I think is one of the issues. So academics should be more humble, I would say, and listen more to what is happening there, you know, in this bottom-up activism. And that's why there, there is a lot of activists, for example, in Latin America, who uh, actually said that they don't want academics to use their terms. They, they just forbid them to use, because they think it's a way of extractivism also, you know, so there's a very strict rules now how you can deal with, with these movements. I think that anything interesting would come not from academics, definitely. It can come from, from the groups, from artists, from you know, people who are fighting for you know, their rights, whatever, but not from, from academia, no. And, and that's why I also hate it when people, they invite you say, can you come and give a talk on decolonizing development studies? No, I can't, because development studies are colonial throughout. This is how they were created to study the enemy, you know, or the, somebody underdeveloped. So they are grounded in progressivism. What can you do about it? You have to dis just kind of forget about them. You, you have to start from scratch and just, you know, create something different. So that is my problem. I'm very skeptical if it's within academia, because academia is just a bad thing in itself. It has to go. But when it's about genuine efforts of people to change something and make this world a better place, then yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's very